here. The Arts and Lectures Committee of Rhode State Community College welcomes you to No Crying in Baseball. This, which will be presented by Elizabeth Kitts. She is an assistant professor of history at Rhode State. Not only does she have a love of history, she also loves movies and baseball. That goes around in her life and in her teaching. She even works with her students to look at historical events and put them up against the action and the fictionalization that comes from Hollywood movies. It's one of their favorite activities, I think you said, that they really enjoy doing that. <clears throat> the movie A League of Their Own fits this perfectly. If you do not know anything about it, it is at a time when young men were unavailable to play baseball. And what is a nation to do? If you saw some of those posters around, it said, what's a nation to do without young men to play baseball? Elizabeth Kitts is going to help us answer that. The movie helps us answer that. Or does it? She's going to take us behind the big screen into the things that happen before you ever get to be entertained by a movie. And if you'll help me welcome Elizabeth Kitts. Here we go. Thank you for that, and thank you guys for being here tonight. Um, whether you're motivated by being related to me or for the extra credit, I am delighted you are all here. Um, if you just came in and you need to sign up for extra credit, those sign-up sheets are over there. You can hit them at the end before you leave. So we're going to talk tonight about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. That's what the AAPPGL stands for. Um, so the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And a lot of people know the story of the All-American League, as we'll probably shorthand it for the rest of the night, from the movie A League of Their Own. And it's one of my favorite movies. It's an older movie, some of you may not have seen it, it came out in the 90s. Uh, but it tells the Hollywood version of the All-American Girls League. And the All-American Girls League was formed during the war to fill the gap when men went to fight, women played baseball. And the most famous scene from the movie is where our title comes from tonight, There's No Crying in Baseball. And if you've seen the movie, you know Tom Hanks, who's berating one of his players. Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Uh, and so it purports to tell the story of the league. But what we're going to see tonight is one of the problems with this movie, and I love this movie, is that it leaves the false impression that once the war was over, the league just went away. When the men came home from the war and went back to playing baseball, the All-American Girls League just dissolved. And that's not the case. They actually hit their highest rate of popularity in 1948, and they played well into the 1950s. So that's what we're going to see tonight is how the league was formed, how they developed, um, and then how they continued into the 1950s. Over 600 women played professional baseball in the All-American League. Um, and while this movie, again, which I love, kind of portrays that as a stunt, that it was kind of a gimmick uh, during the war. These 600 women did not consider their jobs a stunt. They took what they did very, very seriously. And I'm going to read you throughout the night quotes from some of these women that they've been interviewed and that they've written. Uh, one of them was a player named Dottie Collins, and she threw multiple no-hitters uh, as a pitcher in the All-American League. And she said, we had great players. All we thought about was baseball. We played seven days a week in double headers on Sunday. It was our life. So it wasn't a stunt for these women. They took it very, very seriously. So we're going to look at that and see what that's about. The league was born of World War II. Um, in December 1941, Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and shortly after that, America was drawn into the war. And American men were drafted or volunteered and sent to the European or Pacific theaters. And male American baseball players were no exception. So what we will see is how the war is going to impact Major League Baseball. That summer and fall, the summer of 41, fall of 41, Major League Baseball was at an all-time high in popularity. Ted Williams of the Boston Red Sox was batting 4 of 6. And Joe DiMaggio was in the middle of a 56-game hit streak. And both of those records still stand today. So there was a huge amount of interest uh, and popularity for Major League Ball 
leading up to Pearl Harbor. The Yankees and Joe DiMaggio would go on to play the Dodgers in the World Series that fall, just two months before the bombing at Pearl Harbor. And within a few months after that, the entire starting lineup of the championship Yankees would be fighting the war. And so what we see is a huge gap is going to need to be filled when baseball players start to have to go to war. DiMaggio would join the Army. Ted Williams uh, would become an aviator. Other famous players from the period would go to war as well. I've got to get my names right. Sometimes I can't keep my names. Hank Greenberg from the Detroit Tigers, um, he gave up his $55,000 yearly salary to make 21 bucks a month in the Army. And he told the Sporting News, if there's any last message to be given to the public, let it be that I'm going to be a good soldier. And so men volunteered um, or were drafted to go and serve their country in the war. And although the major league players got the most publicity, the minor leagues took the biggest hit. Minor league players tended to be younger and have fewer dependents, and so they were drafted uh, more readily than major league players. The minor leagues lost over 4,000 men to the draft. Um, 4,000 men had to go and fight in the war, and it decimated minor league baseball in this country. So both major league and minor league baseball are going to suffer from the effects of the war. Even the company that made Louisville Sluggers, the baseball bats, they had to turn production over to making the wooden stocks for the M1 carbine rifles. So across the board, baseball is affected by the war. As soon as the war started, um, the commissioner of baseball, and this was just a few weeks after the bombing at Pearl Harbor, the commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, he wrote a letter to President Franklin Roosevelt asking, what do we do? What do we do about baseball? Will baseball continue? And he wrote, the time is approaching, this is January of 1942, the time is approaching when in ordinary conditions our teams would be heading for spring training. However, inasmuch as these are not ordinary times, I venture to ask what you have in mind as to whether professional baseball should continue to operate. And Franklin Roosevelt was a huge baseball fan. If you can see him there in the middle in a very stylish motor hat, that is a 16-year-old Franklin Roosevelt um, on his prep school baseball team. They were terrible. They were called the Bum Baseball Boys. And when he would go on to Harvard, he would be the manager because he wasn't good enough to play. But he loved baseball. When he became a young lawyer in New York City, um, he almost got fired multiple times because he would sneak out of the office to go watch baseball at the polo grounds. So he was a huge baseball fan. Once he became president, he threw out a record eight opening day pitches more than any other president. So he was a huge fan of baseball. You can see this is from 1934, opening day 1934. And you see in the corner, there's a Red Sox. They won that game. So Roosevelt wrote back the next day. He didn't waste any time writing back to the baseball commissioner um, to say that baseball had to continue. And it's the so-called green light letter where Roosevelt is explaining why we continue, why we have to have baseball, even though we're at war. Why is it so important that we continue to have baseball? And he said, I honestly feel it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. There will be fewer people unemployed, and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. And that means they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off that, their work even more than before. If 300 teams use 5,000 or 6,000 players, these players are a definite recreational asset. That's how he viewed baseball. For at least 20 million of their fellow citizens. And that, in my judgment, is thoroughly worthwhile. So Roosevelt is committed to keeping Major League Baseball going despite the war. What they will find is that intention isn't enough. They wanted to keep Major League Baseball going. But as players like Maggio and Williams and others are going to go and join the military, um, baseball gets left largely in the hands of men who were deemed physically unfit to serve in the military, uh, men who couldn't be drafted. As the war continues, both the majors and the minors were de so depleted of baseball talent that the enduring picture of baseball during World War II becomes Pete Gray, 
the one arm outfielder for the St. Louis Browns. Um, so this was the level of player, and Pete Gray did a great job for having one arm, but he's not Joe DiMaggio. This was the level of play that Major League Baseball was experiencing. And so there's a big problem. By the fall of 1942, attendance at the games is down. Um, many minor league clubs had to shut down entirely because they didn't have enough players left. 4,000 minor league players had been drafted. And so baseball owners, Major League Baseball owners, are very concerned that people will lose interest in baseball. How long will this war go on? What if people forget about baseball? We need to do something to keep their attention. One of the men most concerned about keeping people's attention on baseball is P.K. Wrigley. And P.K. Wrigley of the Chewing Gum Empire, but he also owned the Chicago Cubs, as in Wrigley Field. And P.K. Wrigley was very concerned that people would forget about baseball. And so he met with a few other uh, concerned folks in baseball to figure out what to do. And after much discussion, they decided to start an all-girls team, which is how they refer to it, an all-girls team. And that decision was made for a lot of reasons. Softball was very popular in the Midwest, where the Cubs were located, where Wrigley was, where his fan base was. Um, by the 1940s, uh, girls softball was a very popular sport. And Wrigley was also sure that women couldn't be drafted, and so his players would be safe. They wouldn't be facing the same problem again. And so the decision is made to form an all-girls league. And it's born first as the All-American um, Softball League, the All-American Girls Softball League in the spring of 1943. And the league will go through a lot of name changes over the course of its life, but it's generally referred to as the All-American um, Girls Professional Baseball League. We'll just call it the All-American League for the rest of the night, and you all know what I'm talking about. Baseball wasn't new to women. Women played softball, but they also played baseball. Um, immediately after the Civil War, the first female baseball team is recorded at Vassar, the Vassar Resolutes. This is 1866. Women are playing baseball um, semi-professionally. We also have a record of a team the year after this, in 1867, in Pensacola, Florida, and they had a rule on the books that if a player got tangled up in their hoop skirt while they were running the bases, they would be kicked off the team. So women's baseball has been around. It is not a novelty, it's not a new sport. Uh, in the 1870s and 80s, exhibition games between blondes and brunettes were very popular. Those were played mostly as a joke. Women's baseball was around, but it wasn't taken very seriously. And a newspaper article from, the, from 1883 describes one of these games. A crowd of about 1,500 people assembled on the Manhattan Athletic Club's grounds yesterday afternoon and left themselves hungry and thirsty, watching a game of baseball between two teams composed of girls. One side was composed of brunettes, whose costumes were of an irritating red. The other was blonde, who wore sympathetic blue. These young ladies, as the management of the affair announced, were selected with tender solicitude from 900 applicants. Actresses and ballet girls were barred. They played baseball in a very sad and sorrowful sort of way, as if the vagaries of the ball were too great for their struggling intellects. Four of the girls had become expert for girls. And that's how the newspaper reported on, uh, on baseball heading into the 1900s. Um, as we ease into the 20th century, bloomer leagues start to spread across the country where women play professional baseball. They took it seriously. They often played male teams. But by the 1930s, women's baseball had kind of faded from public memory. It had existed, but softball had supplanted it. Softball was seen as more appropriate for women. The base path was shorter. The ball was bigger. It was seen as a more appropriate sport for females. Um, and in the 1930s, uh, we had seen the proliferation of softball fields across the country. Part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal was for the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, to build recreational areas. And so there were 3,000 recreational areas built across the country, and a lot of them had softball fields. And so by the 1930s into the 1940s, girls' softball was very, very popular. And when P.K. Wrigley decides he needs to put together a girls' baseball team, he knows exactly where to go and look. 
he and his partners are going to start poaching from the softball leagues. 40% um, of their players are going to come from the Amateur Softball Association. And so he knows where to look to go find good players. The game that he envisions is a hybrid of baseball and softball. In the early day, early years of the league, excuse me, in the early years of the league, the ball starts a little bit bigger and the base paths are a little bit shorter. And then by the end uh, of the league, when it, when it finally goes under, um, it looks a lot more like baseball. The ball is the same size, the base, base paths are almost the same size. And so it becomes much more like hardball baseball than softball that women were expected to play. Wrigley used his existing scouting network. He owned the Cubs, so he has a built-in infrastructure. He used the Cubs scouting network to find players across the U.S., across Canada. Um, they went to high schools, they went to churches, they went to factories looking for women who played baseball. Most of them were between 17 and 22, but some were as young as 14 um, that were recruited to come for a tryout. The league was only open to white women. Um, so it was a segregated league. When Major League Baseball integrated in 1947, there was discussion in the All-American League, should we integrate as well? But they never did. Uh, it stayed an entirely segregated, whites-only league for its entire history. Um, some black women tried out, uh, or went to the tryouts and weren't allowed to try out. There's one instance where um, one uh, African-American player was allowed to work out with the team but they weren't allowed to be a part of the league. And so black women had to go and join the Negro Leagues and play with men. And, and that's who you're looking at there. Um, that's Tony Stone and Polly Morgan uh, and Amy Johnson, who were three of the famous women who went and played with the Negro Leagues. So our All-American League is gonna remain an all-white league. Competition was very strenuous to get into the league. Interest for trying out was high because Wrigley was paying really well. Wrigley was offering his players between $45 and $85 a week. $45 was more than a teacher made in a whole month. And so a lot of women were very eager to come try out just because it paid so well. Tryouts were held um, across the country. And four non-major league teams, or four non-major league cities, excuse me, were selected to be the host cities for the teams. Um, those cities were Racine and Kenosha in Wisconsin, Rockford in Illinois, and South Bend in Indiana. And you can see on my handy dandy map here, um, that's Chicago. So the cities that we're gonna pick are close enough to Wrigley and his, his Cubs machine um, that he can run this very easily, and that was done deliberately. Wrigley agreed to fund half of the operating costs for all the teams, and the home cities agreed to pick up the rest, and the league would be run as a nonprofit. Any money that got made got sent back into the league or into community baseball programs, so it wasn't run to make money, it was run to keep up interest in baseball. Teams would consist of 15 players, a manager, a business manager, and a female chaperone. We've got to have that female chaperone, and we'll see why. Wrigley and his partners believed that recruiting former Major League Baseball players to be the managers would give the league more validity. It would, it would increase interest in coming out to see the games. Uh, and so famous players like Jimmy Fox and future Hall of Famer Max Carey will be managers in the All-American League. The players are female players. They sign contracts with the league, not with individual teams. And that means they can be traded anywhere, anytime, that anybody thought was necessary in order to keep the teams balanced and in order to keep up a high level of competition. Regional tryouts were held. Um, if you make the cut in your regional tryout, you get invited to Chicago for the big tryouts. And for a lot of these girls, and a lot of them were girls, this was their first trip away from home. One player said, I had never ridden on a train, and I sat up all night in a Pullman car because I did not understand how that seat was going to be my bed. And so for a lot of them, it was their very first time away from home. I was 14 years old and had been raised on a farm. The tryouts were awe-inspiring, and they kept us very busy. We stayed at the Belmont Hotel, not far from Wrigley Field, and my mother came up for a few days and stayed with some friends. And after that, she went home. I was very homesick. And she said, well, you can come home with me and everything will be all right, or you can stay. I wanted to play ball so bad I stayed. 
The other players took me under their wing and mothered me and I got over the homesickness. I liked playing ball so much I just wanted to play. And I was so young that the thought never crossed my mind that I wouldn't make the league. Of course, she went on to make the league. Um, spring training started in May of 1943 at Wrigley Field. And so for a lot of these women, just being able to be on the field at Wrigley was the experience of a lifetime. The tryouts were very rigorous. They tested fielding, pitching, catching, all of the skills. And they finally settled on 60. 60 women who made the cut and were signed to professional contracts. So Wrigley has created this new league along with some partners. And one of the main purposes is to keep interest up in baseball. But the other thing he wanted to do with the All-American League was to serve a patriotic function. He wants the league to represent America during wartime to keep morale up on the home front. And Wrigley, P.K. Wrigley was very well known for his support, his financial support, his business support of the war effort. Um, he had, at one point, donated all of the aluminum that he used to wrap his gum to the U.S. government. He had the men who were supposed to be out drilling in trees for gum to make his chewing gum go drill for rubber instead to help the military. And he had donated his very elaborate light system from the Wrigley Building in Chicago to the government so that it could be used for military purposes. And by the end of the war, he had turned over production of all of his chewing gum product to the military. So all the gum went to the soldiers. So he was well known for supporting the war effort. He expected his players to do the same. That drove the selection of these cities. Not only are they close to Chicago, but these four cities were war production cities. They had factories. And Wrigley wanted to have a team in each of these cities so that folks who worked in the factory all day making supplies for the war could go enjoy a game at night. They could have something to look forward to. He also chose them because they were close enough. You could drive and not waste your whole ration of gas. Gasoline was rationed, and so you had to be very careful about how much you traveled. So for all of these reasons, Wrigley picks these cities, uh, and a lot of it is to reward these factory workers. He wants them to have something to look forward to. The girls in the league, and that's how they were referred to as the girls, the girls in the league were expected to do their patriotic duty. They hosted blood drives, they visited hospitals, um, they posed with soldiers, they played um, charity games, and before every game, they made the V for Victory sign before the National Anthem was played. And so he viewed this not just as a tool to keep interest in baseball up, but as a mechanism for patriotism. Let's keep morale up in the entire country as well. And so the girls were expected to, uh, to participate in that. A large part of Wrigley's appeal to patriotism was deliberately crafting his players as the All-American Girl Next Door. It's the All-American Girls League, and his players are going to be All-American Girls. He deliberately set out to distance his players from female softball players. Softball was popular, but female softball players didn't have a very good reputation. Um, they were often portrayed in the press as too masculine, or tomboys, or worst of the worst in 1940s America as lesbians. And Wrigley didn't want that perception in his brand new baseball league. And so he's going to take some pretty drastic steps to make sure to distinguish softball players from his baseball girls. He wanted what he said, girls that looked like girls. So he's very much going to stress they have to be as feminine as possible. One of his key advisors put it this way. Fans don't particularly like women's softball, where a gal who looks like Joe hits it out of the park. If people want to see tomboys play softball, they'll go to the city park and watch for free. If they plan on paying for tickets, they'll want to see ladies. And so Wrigley is going to set out to make sure he has ladies playing hardball baseball in his new league. Newspapers of the time reflected this same attitude. Um, the Saturday Evening Post, which was a major newspaper, described female softball players. Give them a cut of tobacco and these female softball players would look just like their big league brothers. 
And Time Magazine said that a lot of players were left out of the recruitment process for the All-American League because they were, quote, too uncouth, too hard-boiled, or the worst, too masculine. So we have to make sure that we're going to have ladies. That's what people are going to pay to see. The feminine appearance of his ball players on and off the field was so important to Wrigley that he's going to go to some pretty drastic lengths um, to ensure that people thought of his ladies, his ball players, as feminine as women. Starting with the team names. Major League Baseball has the Red Sox and the Yankees and the Dodgers. The All-American League has the Daisies and the Bells and the Peaches, not to mention the Colleens and the Sallies and the Chicks. Of the 15 teams that existed over the course of the league, 12 of them have very feminine names. Uh, and again, that was very deliberate to drive home. This is a league of ladies. They're ladies first and ball players second. Um, so these were deliberate choices made in, in the naming. In the movie, A League of Your Own, it's the Rockford Peaches, is the main team that's featured in that movie. Wrigley also wants to make sure that the whole feminine, my players are ladies idea is put forth visually. So they're going to play in dresses. Softball players wore pants or shorts. His players in the American League are going to wear one piece tunic dresses that were modeled after field hockey uniforms from the period. Um, you wore silk shorts underneath. There's a little belt and your skirt better be six inches above your knee. Our female baseball players, as you might imagine, were reluctant to play baseball in this. Um, they had a lot of concerns. A lot of them were worried about how immodest it was, especially how short the skirts were. One of them said, being from the country, I was used to working in the fields in overalls. I had never even worn shorts. And then they're expected to play baseball in this dress. Um, for pitchers and catchers especially, this was very hard because of the movements they have to make when they play, squatting and reaching. And so there was a lot of resistance to this uniform. Um, it also didn't keep them safe. A lot of the girls would get injuries on their legs from sliding into bases. When sliding into bases, the girls would receive large bloody bruises on their thighs um, that they refer to as strawberries. And that looks like that. Um, from what you get from sliding into bases with no protection. A player said that ridiculous uniform. The sliding pads weren't adequate. Our thighs had strawberries and abrasions from sliding. They weren't nearly warm enough either for playing in cold weather. Remember, we're in Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana. Um, I nearly froze to death at one game in Kenosha. It was snowing and they're playing in their dress. The fans came to the game bringing blankets and hot thermos bottles. After the league, I never played in anything except long pants or a regular uniform, and I played organized ball until I was 68 years old. And that was a player named Dorothy Montgomery, who still, at 68, was outraged about having to play in this dress. However, they were willing to do it. As it says in the movie, you can't play in this, you can't play for us. And women who didn't want to play in this uniform were sent home. And there were a lot of players who were willing to, um, to do whatever they needed to do in order to play baseball. Another player was asked if this ever stopped her from sliding. Did it ever make you think twice before you slid in the base? And she said, nope, I just slid in head first. <laughs> what I want to show you, if it works, so cross your fingers and hold your mouth right, um, is a newsreel from 1951 that shows a little bit more of this in action, um, how the players uh, reacted to the uniforms and, and how many injuries they got from playing in them. Looks promising. Fingers crossed. Last time baseball brings out the All-American Girl Baseball League for spring training at Alexandria, Virginia. Two teams are working out, the Fort Wayne Daisies and the Racine Bells, getting in shape for an opening day doubleheader. Donnie Schroeder is quite confident that her hair won't get in her eyes. And keeping her eye on the ball is catcher Kate Von Brough. Okay, gals, play ball. This one is wide, and Gene Marlowe is willing to wait. Gene Bunce 
it, the squeeze is on. Timmy Isom slides home with a run and a nicely bruised leg. Better a bruise than long pants, eh, gals? Joe Weaver hits the long ball, almost out of the ballpark. Boy, that clears the base path. And inside the park, Homer, by a whisker. So better a bruise um, than long pants is what they're saying. And I know there's some softball players in this room that would probably disagree with that, that would much rather have long pants than have a giant bruise. But those are the uniforms I played in, again, to reinforce our players are ladies first and ball players second. Looking the part was not enough. They had to act like ladies as well. Um, a pamphlet, a brochure was created, a handbook called the Guide to All-American Girls, how to look better, feel better, and be more popular. And this was issued to all of the players. And highlights from it included, you have certain responsibilities because you too are in the limelight. Your actions and appearance on and off the field reflect on the whole profession. It is not only your duty to do your best to hold up the standard of this profession, but to do your best to keep everyone else in line. We hand you this manual to guide you in your personal appearance. We ask you to follow the rules of behavior for your own good, as well as for the future success of girls baseball. A healthy mind and a healthy body are the true attributes of an all-American girl, right? That's the picture we're selling, the all-American girls. Um, some other highlights from the code of conduct. Always appear in feminine attire when not actively engaged in practice. At no time may a player wear slacks or shorts in public. Absolutely forbidden to wear pants in public. They're going to do it anyway. It's just against the rules. Boyish bobs are not permissible, and in general, your hair should be well-groomed at all times with longer hair preferred. Lipstick should always be on. Lipstick was apparently super important to your success in baseball um, because this was one of the most enforced rules. Smoking or drinking is not permissible in public places. Liquor drinking will not be permissible under any circumstances. Obscene language will not be allowed. There's rules about dating. There's rules about acceptable places to eat, where players could drive their cars, um, who they were allowed to associate with, and of course there's a curfew. All of that is to control their behavior so that they don't step outside of ladies. Ladies first, ball players second. So we're going to control their appearance, we're going to dictate their behavior. And if you break a rule, forget to put your lipstick on, you get fined. Five bucks for the first offense, ten bucks for the second offense. You do it three times, you get suspended. And in modern money, so you understand what we're talking about, that's about 160 bucks for the second offense. So not an a small amount of money for forgetting to put on your lipstick. One player remembered um, that she was stopped on the way to the batter's box in the middle of a game, a tight game, tense game. She's on her way up to bat, and the female chaperone stops her to put on her lipstick because she'd forgotten to put on her lipstick. So in the middle of the game, even, these rules were enforced. For the first several years of the league, to take it even a notch further, there was a charm school that the ladies were required to go to. And this is another of the very famous scenes from the movie where they're being taught how to walk with a book on their head and how to cross their legs properly and sip tea. And it's actually a very accurate representation of what the girls were, were required to do. Uh, and it was described again in Time Magazine. Part of their training is to learn about makeup, posture, and other whatnots, usually neglected by lady athletes. So you can see the stereotype of women who played sports, and this is what Wrigley is working against. The Charm School was run by um, cosmetics entrepreneur uh, Helena Rubenstein, and was based on, quote, gracious living programs at colleges like Smith and Vassar. So you could go to a woman's college and learn and major in gracious living. And so uh, the, the Charm School curriculum was based on that. Each player learns makeup application, posture, carriage. Um, they got pre-game tips like run your fingers over a bar of soap before you go play so you don't get dirt on your fingernails because, you know, heaven forbid. Uh, and so all of these things, again, focusing on their appearance as ladies. They were issued a beauty kit with specific instructions. 
on how they were supposed to use it. Only brunettes were required to wear face powder. Blondes, it was okay. Um, lipstick had to always be on. There are two paragraphs in that manual about applying lipstick properly. Lipstick is critical. And so these rules were very strictly enforced and they were required to go to this charm school. Each girl should be at all times presentable and attractive, whether on the playing field or at leisure. Study your own beauty culture possibilities. I'm not really even sure what that means. And without overdoing your beauty treatment at the risk of attaining gaudiness, we don't want gaudy, we want the ladies, practice the little measure that will reflect well in your appearance as a real all-American girl. So how to put makeup on, how to get in and out of a car gracefully, how to enunciate correctly, how to make small talk. All these things were taught to the women at the charm school. And it was also drilled into them to be quiet, to be demure, to be um, not loud in public. The all-American girl should avoid behavior that would make her conspicuous in public. One of the cardinal rules is to not talk too loudly. She should avoid using other people's names in a loud voice. And there is nothing more vulgar than bragging about your accomplishments or achievements. So when you go out in public, put on your lipstick first, and then be quiet. Don't be conspicuous, and for goodness sake, don't talk about your batting average and the fact that you play baseball professionally. So this is what the women were expected to do. Instructions were included on how to deal with male fans. Um, the women got a lot of attention, some wanted, some unwanted, because they were interviewed and they were in time, um, and a lot of the newspapers and magazines of the period. The advice is, there is always a way in which a lady can politely avoid unwanted company or attention. So even when you're being harassed, be polite about it when you say whatever it is you need to say. You have to wonder how some of them responded. This is Faye Dancer. Um, most historians agree that she was the inspiration for the Madonna character in A League of Their Own, all the way May. And so if you've seen the movie, that character's a little on the wild side. And so is Faye Dancer. Uh, and she received lots of invitations from male fans who had seen her in Life magazine. And my favorite one is this letter. This, this guy was stationed in France. He saw her picture. He wrote her a letter. And he said, he led with this. I am not proposing. But I've got a thousand bucks and an old jalopy in New Jersey, and I can relocate anywhere. So he was not ready for marriage, but he was ready to you know, run around a little bit. She also had an admirer in the mob. She was in, uh, in Illinois, and she had men from the, the mob in Chicago who would come out to watch her play. These two gangsters would come to see us play. The kingpin liked me. Once he even asked me if I wanted anyone killed, and I thought about it, and I told him, maybe the umpire. <laughs> um, so she was a character and a half, and you have to wonder how often she got fined. Um, it was a lot. She got fined a lot. We'll, we'll come back to her in a little bit. Not all of the players liked any of this. A lot of them hated the uniform just for modesty and safety reasons, but they really hated the charm school because they felt they were being looked down on, especially girls who had come from rural country areas. They told us how to put on lipstick and how to walk in high heels. I didn't even own a pair of high heels. I had to borrow a pair. We had to learn to lift our little finger when we drank a cup of tea. The Rubenstein people were looking down their noses at us as tomboys. So there was a lot of resistance to doing these things, but they did them. If they didn't wear the uniform, if they didn't go to charm school, if they didn't present as a lady, they were out. And there were a lot of women who would, who would want that job. I would have done most anything that wasn't sinful just for the opportunity to play baseball. And that was the general philosophy. Whatever it takes for me to keep getting paid to play baseball. To ensure that our ladies followed all these rules, because remember there's punishments, there's fines if you break them, each team had a female chaperone. And the chaperone's job was watch the girls. Um, they also served as a trainer, so if the girls got hurt, fix the girls. And they also served as a therapist, listened to the girls. So the chaperone had a lot of hats they had to wear. And most of the players, when they would give interviews later in life, they talked about the chaperones being pretty good, pretty reasonable, trying to take care of them, especially the younger girls. But they were also targets for pranks constantly. And Faye Dancer was responsible for a lot of them. 
Um, she would initiate new chaperones by coating the light bulbs in their room in very, very smelly cheese, so that when you turn the light bulbs on, the heat makes your whole room smell like terrible cheese. Um, she would replace the middles of their Oreos with toothpaste. Uh, she, she put peanut butter on their toilet seats, so kind of low-key pranks. There was one that was very famous that was done by her best friend, Pepper Davis, also a character. And Pepper Davis targeted their chaperone one day, you know, a woman named Dorothy Hunter. And Pepper said later in life, she gave this interview, Dottie was a great gal with a fiery temper, but she was deathly afraid of fish. So one morning, I went fishing with the guys and caught some perch. We knew her routine after each game. She would take care of everything, then she would take a bubble bath. As she was about to get into the tub, one of the girls called her up from their room and said they had a Charlie horse. So Dottie put on her robe and went to take care of the fake Charlie horse. Meanwhile, I slipped in the bathroom and put the fish in the tub. She came back and got ready to get in the tub, and all 15 of us on the team were waiting in the hallway. All of a sudden, we heard a scream, and she came running out into the hall, all wet, no towel, no robe, or anything. And since I was the only one that fished, I got fined $25, which is about 450 bucks in today's money. That was a lot of money in those days, Pepper said. That's Dorothy, so if you can kind of picture her, you've had a long day, you've dealt with these players, you're ready for your bubble bath, it's full of fish. <laughs> um, and so that was one of the, the more famous pranks that was played on one of the chaperones. It was reinforced constantly to be feminine, to be ladylike, that you're a lady first and a ball player second. And this was stressed heavily in all of the photos and press releases and newsreels that the league would release, that the league encouraged. They want their publicity to focus on ladies first, ball players second. I'm gonna to try to show you another newsreel. The first one works, so fingers crossed. These feminine phenomenons play in the All American Girls Baseball League. It's the turnstile striking in the Loops, eight Midwest cities South Bend, Fort Wayne, New York, Rockford, Kenosha, Grand Rapids, and Kalamazoo. Look close, folks. Not softball, but real Major League type baseball and managed by former Major League stars such as Jimmy Fox. The great slugger shows his Fort Wayne shortstop, Dobby Schroeder, a new batting style. Bonnie Baker of the Kalamazoo Lassie. She's the team's regular second baseman, a base woman, excuse me, but doubles back to the plate, whether at home or on the diamond. Bonnie shares this model green cottage with her husband and baby girl. Bonnie's ability on the diamond is exceeded only by her instinctive ability about the house. Yes, sir, she can handle that six ounce pot with the same facility that she handles a 32 ounce bat. That's one of the newsreels that was released and approved by the Lee. She's a mother first, she's a lady first, and then she's a ball player. I was editing this video last night and my 16 year old son came in the room and he said what are you watching that's super sexist and i said yes it is but that was the point they were trying to keep up this idea this feminine idea um, ideal of the ball players these feminine phenomenons play in the all american girls make these feminine apparently we're going to watch it several times um here are some ads that were put out by the league if you can see it the nation's outstanding feminine baseball stars. Remember, everything is about projecting this image of ladies first. So we've got these women who are participating in a traditional male field, baseball, but they are being um, aggressively encouraged, and in some places fine if they don't comply, uh, to present this feminine atmosphere to make sure that, that they look and act like what society expected women in the 1940s to look and act like. And one of the reasons I love league history and I love a league of their own is because it's this beautiful, perfect little microcosm of what's happening in the rest of America. So we have women in a male field baseball. They're being required to maintain a very feminine appearance. And the purpose of that was to drive home the fact that they're not trying to replace the men. This is temporary. They're only doing their patriotic duty. And we see the same thing at large in the country. 
19 million women went into the workforce during World War II, 6 million of them for the first time. And so we have all of these female factory workers to support the war effort. Rosie the Riveter represents them. Um, and Rosie's job is to encourage women, it is your patriotic duty, to go out and work in the factory. So you are going to go and take on a traditionally male job, but you're going to look cute while you do it. Rosie's in her red, white, and blue, right? That's not an accident. Her nails are manicured, here, if you can see it in the picture. She's got her lipstick on, right? She's very pretty. She's an attractive poster. And her job is to encourage women to get out and do their patriotic duty, but look feminine while they did it. And this was seen across um, industries in America. Rosie might be making airplanes, but she's gonna look good while she does it. So it's the same idea as what our baseball players are being made to do. They're in a male field, they're playing baseball, but they're gonna wear a dress and they're always gonna have lipstick on um, and they'll be punished if they step outside of those ideas. Some other examples from America at large, beauty line, assembly line. They're making electrical sub-assemblies. So this is a factory, but we lead with beauty line, assembly line. Photographers would go into, um, into industrial factories and look for the prettiest workers they could and take pictures of them. One of the biggest wartime employers was Boeing on the West Coast, and Boeing employed 50,000 employees during the war, half of whom were women, a big chunk of Boeing's workforce was women, um, and they had a fashion designer come in to make work uniforms just for the women so that it would remind them that they needed to be feminine. Boeing called it their FQ, their femininity quotient. Um, and they had a whole council about it. If you were a woman and you worked at Boeing, the Women's Recreational Activity Council, you had to go to classes on how to dress, how to do your makeup, how to have poise, how to work on your personality. That's a little insulting. Uh, but also you can keep up your FQ, your femininity quotient. And they were called Flying Fortress Fashions because Boeing is making airplanes. Uh, and so they designed these special uniforms. The woman they brought in was a fashion designer who dressed Rita Hayworth and Katherine Hepburn. And she made these uniforms for Boeing. So again, you're gonna have a man's job, but you're gonna make sure you stay feminine while you do it. One of the really common headlines in newspapers during the 40s was bombshells making bombshells. You go into the factory, you find the prettiest girl you can, and that's whose picture you take as a real life Rosie. This is an example of that. Um, this woman is 19 years old, and she works in the dope room, which is a, a liquid plastic, making coatings for an early version of drones that were used for target practice during the war. And she had been crowned queen of the company at their company picnic, and so the army came to take her picture. And this series of pictures, including this one, would launch her into a Hollywood career. You might know who it is. You say it again? Good guess. On the right track. Say it louder. It's Marilyn Monroe. This is a 19-year-old red-headed Marilyn Monroe who was known as Norma Jean Doherty at this point because she was on her first husband. Um, and this is what launched her into modeling and then into acting and away from husband number one and on to many more husbands. Uh, but she was a real life Rosie. But this is how she was, was started. And so she's a good example of bombshells making bombshells. You find the prettiest girl you can and take their picture. So women in the factories and on the ball field um, were very much aggressively expected to maintain their femininity. Ladies first, workers second, ball players second. And they have to always remember that their role is temporary. These jobs in the factories and the jobs on the ball field of the league, it's not about equality, it's not about equal rights, it's about patriotism, filling a gap in the country during the war and understanding that when the war is over, your job is over. Uh, and so that was something that our ball players and our factory workers had in common. For all of the importance of the rules, you will look like a lady at all times, you will not smoke or drink or cuss. They broke the rules all the time. Okay, these ladies got in trouble and got fined and got suspended constantly. Um, they're forbidden to wear pants in public, but what they would do is wear pants on the bus and as soon as they got wherever they were going, 
throw a skirt on, roll up your pant legs, I'm fine, I'm within guidelines. That was a really common one. They would sneak out of their hotels at night to go drink beer in cemeteries. That was very widespread across the league. Um, sometimes they would use fire escapes to sneak out, and when they would sneak back home, they would find the fire escape and pull up for the night, and then they had a real problem. Uh, it was pretty common to bribe bellhops in hotels to look the other way to let them in. And two players said one night they had they'd gone down the fire escape and they came back and the fire escape had been pulled up. So they have to sneak into the lobby and they bribe the bellhop to look the other way. And they get to the elevator and the elevator doors open and there's their manager in the elevator. And he looked at the two of them and said, I hope you can play tomorrow. And that was it. And he let it go. Um, but they snuck out and got into trouble all the time. Two players once rounded up some local prostitutes and tried to convince the manager that the new rookies had arrived. Here's your new rookies. Um, that didn't go over very well. My favorite story is one girl got suspended because she kept having seances in the locker room. And not just regular, I don't, is there a regular seance? Is that a thing? But not just normal, I don't know what the right word is there. Not just typical seances. Um, but she was, everywhere they went, she was stealing glass eyes from carousel horses and using them in her seance rituals in the locker room. So she got suspended for that because that's, let's face that's a little on the weird side. Um, so, but they broke the rules all the time. Faye Dancer, remember Faye Dancer who played the pranks and, and, and had the mob boyfriend? Um, she had a problem one day. She'd been out partying the night before. And she dropped, for whatever reason, a lit match into a bottle of whiskey, which of course exploded, and burned her pitching hand very badly. So she goes to pitch the game the next day with her hand all bandaged up, and the batter had been with her the night before. And the batter turned to the umpire and said, she's got to take that bandage off. That's going to interfere with pitching, and it's not fair, and she needs to take it off. And so they made her unwrap her hand. So she had to pitch with an unbandaged, very badly burned hand, and she got her revenge by immediately throwing at that girl's head. Um, so these were not delicate flowers, right? These were ball players, and they took their jobs and they took their their after uh, after hours life very seriously. Initial reaction to all of this, to the league, to female players, to their uniforms, to the charm school, was really mixed in society. At first, male reporters especially would make fun of the players, they would make fun of the uniforms, um, and they would say that the women would win games by flirting with the umpires. And that lasted for about five months. And halfway through the first season, it became really obvious that these 60 women who had made the cut were ball players, and they took their jobs seriously. This was not a stunt. They slid into bases, spikes up, they threw at people's heads, um, they made impossible plays in the outfield, and they hit for the fences. They were there to play baseball and to get paid for doing it. Joanne Winter, one of the famous players, she once pitched 63 consecutive scoreless innings. Sophie Curis holds the record for stolen bases at 1114. And the only person with more stolen bases than her in baseball history is Ricky Henderson of the modern Major League Baseball era. Um, Dora Sams once pitched a complete 20 inning game. These were ball players. Jean Fout threw two perfect games in her career. In 1952, she went 20 and 2 and finished the season with a 0 .93, 0 .93 ERA. She gave up 19 runs the whole season in 22 games. Her career ERA was 1.23. So they were not just ball players, they were good ball players. They were good at their job. A lot of sports writers described game six of the 1946 playoff as the best baseball game ever in any league um, between the Rockford Peaches and the Racine Bells. The Peaches had a no-hitter going into the ninth and went into extra innings. And the Bells started a comeback and eventually won in 16 innings in this playoff game, and that gave them the championship. So this was real baseball, and when the fans realized it, they embraced the league. Maybe at first the men came out to see our legs, said Pepper Davis. Remember Pepper Davis with the fish? But they stuck around when they realized they were seeing a darn good brand of baseball. 
attendance grew rapidly by the middle of the first season. By the second season, attendance was up 50%. People couldn't get enough of coming out to see the girls play. And the league extended to more cities. Attendance grew, popularity grew. Um, and the height of the league is 1948, so years after the war is over, the war ends in 1945. So three years after the war is over, the league is still going strong. During 1948, there were 10 teams that recorded almost a million folks who came to watch baseball among those 10 teams. So the movie kind of implies that everything just faded away when the men came home and the war was over, and that was not the case. They kept going strong. Um, and these ladies were no joke, and they proved it repeatedly over and over again with their level of play. Sadly, 1948 was the high. That was the height of the league. Um, and after that, it began to decline for a couple of reasons. One was a change in leadership. It became harder to recruit. Uh, P.K. Wrigley had turned over running the league to one of his advisors, and when that advisor stepped down, things went downhill very quickly. One of the big things that kills the league is television. The war is over. The men have come home, and they've come back to Major League Baseball. And now you can watch that on television in your own house. Television had such a huge effect on sports because it lets you be a fan without living in a city that had a team. You could be a Red Sox fan and live anywhere you could watch a Red Sox game. You could be a Yankees fan and live in the South. Um, and so television had a tremendous impact on sports and it really hurt the league. People could watch men's baseball on TV and they didn't need to go out and watch the Bells or the Peaches or the Daisies play a live game anymore. The other thing that killed the league, and it's probably the most important factor, was the men came home. And women were expected to go back to what they were doing before the war, right? Ladies first, ball players second. And we see this with factory workers too. Men came home, they get their jobs back, women go back home. The same thing's gonna happen to our baseball players. The men come home, Major League Baseball resumes at full strength, um, and women are expected to stop playing baseball, hang it up, and go back to doing um, your what you're supposed to be doing. By 1954, only five teams remained, and the league could not continue. But over its lifespan, over its 12-year lifespan, over 600 women played professional ball at a very high level in the All-American Girls League. When it folded, when the league folded in 1954, it was like it had never happened. People forgot all about it. Pepper Davis said she had to give up trying to explain to people about her baseball career because nobody believed her. Nobody believed that women at one point had played professional baseball. And so the women moved on, they went to school, they got married, they, they had children, um, and people forgot about the All-American League until the 1980s when one of the players started a newsletter. I'm gonna reach out to my former teammates and see what everybody's doing. And the newsletter caught on among a lot of the other players. And this revival of league history happened. And by 1988, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown presented an exhibit on women in baseball. And interest in the league started to explode. Four years later, a League of Their Own was released. Uh, and Americans, a lot for the first time, learned that women had played baseball in World War II. A lot of interviews have been done with these ladies. I've had the, the pleasure to meet one of them who played for the Fort Wayne Daisies. Um, and they get together every year, they have a big reunion, the ones who were left, they're getting a little bit up there. Um, but they had a reunion, this one's from 2019, and they sing their song, where the members of the All-American League, they sing their little victory song, and they reminisce and they just generally they party. They absolutely party, I've heard the stories. Um, last year and this year were canceled because of COVID. These ladies are in their 80s and 90s, and we need to protect the ones who were left. But they interview these women regularly about their time in the league. And a lot of interesting data comes out of these interviews. 35% of these women went on to college after they were done playing baseball. And if you compare that to the rate of women who didn't play baseball, just everybody else, it's 8% for women who didn't play ball. So the women who came out of the league, 35% of them went on to go to college, which is a big chunk. 14% of those got graduate degrees. 
Um, they became doctors and dentists and lawyers and teachers. They became professional athletes in golf and in bowling. Um, their children would go on to work in Major League Baseball. And almost all of them agree that this was the best thing that happened to them. This was a guiding force for their future, was playing ball in the All-American League. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, and I'll, I'll wrap up with it, is from Walt Whitman. And some of my students may be sick of hearing me talk about Walt Whitman, but I will always talk about Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman said in 1888, baseball is our game, the American game. I connect it with our national character. And the history of the league shows that it's not just for men, that national character is for everybody. Uh, and so it's, it's a fascinating history of the league, and I invite you to explore it more and see what these women had to offer their country in the 40s. All right. Any questions? It's just like my class. It's okay. silence. Don't make eye contact. So, so I'm, I'm interested in how something could be so popular and then not just be not popular, but forgotten. But vanish? Yeah, it just vanish. There's a huge movement in the 50s, um, and spoiler alert for my students, we haven't gotten there in class yet in popular media and print media and, um, and radio for women to go back home. And you see it in magazine ads and you see it in Father Knows Best and all of those sitcoms from the 50s, right? And so it became not acceptable anymore for women to do this. And a lot of them didn't want to talk about that they had done this. That was the kind of the mindset in the 50s. Make sense? Good question. Anything else? How did the men react? these women taking over baseball, like, were they happy here? Which, specify like which soldiers. men? Soldiers. Ah, that's a good question. The soldiers, for the most part, liked it. Uniformed soldiers got in free of the games. Um, the women were forced to interact with them for, for publicity purposes. Uh, and so women's baseball was really popular, especially among the enlisted. The male baseball players kind of thought it was, like, major league players like Teddy Williams and, and, uh, and DiMaggio kind of thought it was cute. Um, that they'll look at these women playing baseball. But for most of the enlisted men, it was very well received. Good questions. What else? Did I get in under the time? I think maybe I did. Oh, it's 7.03. It's so close. <laughs> Any further questions? Yes? Were all of the managers above draft age? Um, yes, because they wanted to get former former major league players, um, and there was a huge pushback against the idea that major league players might be exempt, that their draft status might be changed, or they could stay home. And so Kennesaw Mount Landis, the baseball commissioner, was very, very careful to not interfere with men being drafted at all. And so the, the male managers were, were older or had injuries and couldn't serve. What else? If there's no more questions, oh, where? I don't see. Raise your hand. That'd be really big. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there any kind of like movement to bring this kind of thing back? Yes. Um, actually, the uh, the All American Girls they have a terrific website full of great interviews and, and newspaper clippings and all kinds of stuff. And recently, I think 2019, they have formed the um, All American Girls League, which is kind of the revival of this to bring back women in baseball. Um, and they, they had a presence at, I can't remember what year it was, but the, the Little League World Series, so Monet Davis, um, the girl pitcher who came out and kind of was a, ph a phenom at that World Series. And so they're building on the much more visible participation of women in sports to try to bring back women in baseball. That's a terrific question. What else? I don't want to miss anybody. I left my reading glasses at home, so I'm basically blind. So I can't see you. Yes? Uh, is there any other sports that you know that visit? That's a, really, that's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, the, and if you couldn't hear, the question was, were there any other sports that created female leagues to replace male athletes? Uh, and I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but that's something that I will look up. That's what I always tell my students. You're going to ask me questions I don't know the answer to, but let's look it up and find out. So I don't know, but we can find out. What else? All right. 
if there's no more questions, um, thank you all very, very much for coming. Did you need to? Well, let's talk to you first. <laughs>